Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Pankaj's inaugural lecture. Uh, my name is Ian Gordon. I am the head of the college here, and I wanted to welcome everybody who's come. Before uh, Gareth introduces Pankaj more formally, I just want particularly to mention uh, a very special set of people who are on the front row who have come from all over the world. We have Weber, uh, Pankaj's wife, Sheila, Bila, and the most important person I have to say, I'm a bit biased, is Avi, who is there for his very first engineering lecture ever. <laughs> uh, and Anbar and Anna as well. So welcome particularly to your family, Pankaj. Um, I know that there were lots of other colleagues, students, people that have collaborated with Pankaj and Friends and so forth who are here. Thank you very much for coming. Um, pass over now to Gareth, who will formally get the proceeding underway. Well, thanks very much, Ian. I'm told there's nothing gruesome in this lecture, sorry, but if you do feel faint, there are aisles and you may have a lie down. Um, Pankaj, um, we're looking forward to this. Uh, you moved from being a civil engineer dealing with earthquakes and nuclear power to dealing with bits of bones. So this is quite a transformation for anybody. Um, but you, you've, you've been around for, uh, Edinburgh for a very long time, a uh, very esteemed colleague, um, and uh, I'm, I'm delighted that we've finally got around to doing your, your inaugural. Um, so Pankaj, as I said before, is a, is a, is a civil engineer, earthquake engineer, and he's worked across a, a wide range of different, different areas. Uh, one of the key things that led to this was he established the, uh, the interdisciplinary computational biomechanics group, uh, which exploits numerical methods in the solution of real clinical problems. So this is an area where we are uh, trying to really uh, motor along. Uh, so apart from his, his excellent research, his excellent teaching, Pankaj also acts as our international dean for South Asia. And one of the things that he's been involved in is the setting up of the Gujarat Biotechnology University, along with David Gray and others, uh, in biology, and uh, we believe that's going uh, going great guns. So uh, we hope that keeps going and that he keeps visiting. Um, so today's talk is about um, computational modelling. I think we'll explain it more uh, more formally, but essentially, it's uh, it's very popular now to do lots of modelling, and he's going to explain why that might more and more complicated things might not be a good idea. So the, the talk of his uh, is the title of his talk is the principle of parsimony and computational biomechanics. I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me? Great. OK. <clears throat> uh, thanks, Ian, and thanks, Garrett. Uh, yeah, finally, I'm doing this talk. As Garrett said, um, I thought that there should be at least one person in the audience who can seriously critique my talk, and that person is there. Uh, so uh, so there, uh, here we are. So starting the first things first, a uh, lot of you know me, the story of my name. So Pankaj, Pankaj uh, is a strange one. So I basically chopped off my surname as a kid. So all my degrees have a one name, but after I arrived in Edinburgh, it became impossible to live with one name, right? Because any internet form you fill, it asks for the first name and a surname. Doesn't work, so just repeat the damn thing. So that was really the solution. A single name has not always been the best idea. So this is my first journal paper written by, my, uh, by me and my supervisor. At that time, Ninath Bichinich, and it appeared as Ninath Pankaj Bichinich. So I became the middle name of this chap. And then it was referenced by a very famous chap. He was one of the doyens of finite element, Chris, um, uh, Mike Chrisfield, who sat there with me. And I got referenced as, sorry, I got referenced as Bichinich NP. So Pankaj became a P. So that was the ultimate reduction. OK. Uh, now, a little bit about me. So as Gareth said, I'm a, I'm a civil engineer. I did my first degree in uh, 
uh, at IIT Delhi, and most of the time I spend on stage. So I was well versed with theater. Less in the classroom, but managed to graduate. Uh, then moved on to do earthquake engineering. So I did my master's and post PhD, a lot of consulting work as an academic uh, in earthquake engineering. And this is the Kakrapar Atomic Power Plant, whose lot of buildings I actually qualified for seismic behavior. So a lot of seismic analysis related to dams and nuclear power plants. Uh, solid mechanics, I went to do my PhD uh, in numerical methods at Swansea with this gentleman called Oleg Zinkovich, who is one of the pioneers of the finite element method. Uh, he had something like, you know, what 20 odd honoris causa degrees from across the world. His first job as an academic was at Edinburgh, but in Edinburgh never awarded him an honoris causa PhD. So that, that was an interesting one, and he kept complaining about it. Uh, uh, and this was my uh, other supervisor, Nenad Bichinich, and the person in the middle, some of you might be able to recognize, is Professor Asif Usmani. Asif started the structures in fire in Edinburgh. Uh, he's now based in Hong Kong. In many ways, was responsible for my moving to Edinburgh. He's been a friend for 40 years or so. Uh, computational biomechanics. I started after coming to Edinburgh, so no background in bio side of things. Uh, and of course, I came to Edinburgh some five summers ago, which is 25 years. Yeah, so, uh, so that's the way it works. So I've had a few admin roles. So this is as international dean for South Asia and really proud to have initiated this link with the government of Gujarat which led to the establishment of this Gujarat Biotechnology University. And I think Ian just visited and had a very successful uh, trip there. The other thing, role I have, uh, which has actually enabled a lot of interesting meetings. This is with the Prime Minister of India. Uh, the other interesting role is as director of Edinburgh India Institute, where we organize ta talks. And this person in the middle here, is Lord Parekh, he's a big man in uh, multiculturalism and uh, he's done a lot of books on Gandhian thought and things. He's, uh, he's one of the really, really good individuals to speak to. Okay, so about the talk, the principle of parsimony in computational biomechanics. Uh, what's the principle of parsimony, also called the Occam's razor? And Ockham was a 14th century friar, a philosopher, and a theologist, theologian rather. And his concept was when presented with competing hypotheses that make the same predictions, one should select the solution with the fewest assumptions. So obviously the, what, the way medics deal with this, they'll say if you hear hoof beats, think of horses and not zebras. And my interpretation is if you call your partner and you hear on, on, on the mobile that the mobile is switched off, then think that the battery has run out and not something else. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's the way uh, it works. And actually, this principle of parsimony is very similar to Einstein's condensed line Everything should be made as simple as possible, but not, not simpler. So moving on, what is, so that was parsimony. What is computational mechanics or biomechanics? So computational biomechanics or mechanics is basically simulating the mechanical behavior using models. And these models and mechanics are actually created uh, is are part of a computer program. And one of the most popular, uh, one of the most popular methods to do that is the finite element method. And there, are, in my opinion, there are four of these, of these pioneers. Uh, so John Turner, he worked, I think, for, sorry, he worked for Boeing. Uh, 
John Argyris, Argyris was at Stuttgart, Ray Clough was at Berkeley, and Oleg Zinkovich, as I said, was one of my supervisors at Swansea. And we're trying to get clinicians involved in using finite elements. So this is an editorial that I wrote with a couple of my colleagues in Edinburgh uh, in for a clinical journal. So try and explain the finite element method for the uninitiated in a single slide. So what is finite element method? It requires basically four key information, geometry. So you define the geometry of the system. Uh, and this geometry is then divided into simple parts. These could be uh, in two-dimensional space. It could be rectangles, triangles. In 3D, there could be tetrahedra or brick-like looking bits. So 1D, 2D. And once you have done that, then the whole system is called a mesh. The second is material properties. So material properties could be linear or nonlinear. Uh, they could be homogeneous same properties at different points or vary with place to place. So that's some work. We've, we've done quite a bit of work. They could be time independent or time dependent. Uh, the other thing you need is boundary conditions. So obviously, if you have an object like that and you apply a force, uh, mathematically, it's just fly off in space. So you need some kind of support conditions which, uh, which exist there. And then, of course, you're subjected to some kind of loads. And what we are ultimately looking for is things like deformations, strains, stresses, and failure mechanisms. So that's what finite element is. Now, let me very quickly, before moving into the, um, in the mechanic side of the biomechanic side of things, let me give you a very early example of OCAM's razor. And this is, in a way, an early experience for me. Uh, so this is part of my, actually, my, my PhD. And I, I'll not try and explain this figure. But basically, uh, this is uh, a plastic yield surface. Sorry. So that's an yield surface. And what you see, it's a, it's a kind of a pyramid which has corners, and these corners are called singularities. And one of the big things in this is that these singularities create a problem, and you need to define when this singularity occurs and do special tricks to, uh, to handle those singularities. Now, what I did was I managed to work out some specific equations to identify when the singularity needed to be tr treated. And I presented it at a conference as a PhD student. And it so turned out that the equations I had derived were, were different or from one of the big established stars, a gentleman called René de Bourse, who actually became a professor at the age of 30, two years after his PhD. And he was extremely, he's now, he's moved around, he was a Regius professor at Glasgow, now he's a centenary professor at Sheffield. He's got an H index of something like 90 or something. Uh, and he was in the audience. I said, oh, I know you. these equations can't be right because uh, I've got equations which are different. And I said, I've got the derivation here. So, and so there was a bit of an argument. And then an interesting thing happened. I mean, this is the old days when there was no email. I'm, I'm pretty old, yeah? Uh, so those days, this guy, he, he goes back, and then he writes a letter saying, you were right, right? And then he actually writes a paper correcting his mistake. So you can see this has been that his old equations have been found to be incorrect. And this is, and he names me as one of the authors. And I'm suddenly becoming a star because I have found a mistake with the, with a, with a big shot. But then Oleg Zinkovich, who was, who believed in parsimony, and I didn't, he said, look here, 
okay, you got these singularities, these funny corners, why don't you just simply round them up like that? And the singularities disappear. And that actually just removes that particular problem altogether. And it seems like, a very, and it gives you more identical results. So all this business of deriving equations and treating singularities is all rubbish, right? So, uh, and that is an experience that look here, you can have a much simpler solution than going for a complex equations and solutions, okay. So now, why should, coming back to biomechanics, why should healthcare be interested in models? Firstly, they are cheap and a great alternative to clinical trials. Again, healthcare believes in clinical trials. It takes years, costs a lot, but you can actually do quite a bit without having to do clinical trials. Uh, they can be used for patient stratification. If you believe in clinical trials, if you want to optimize trial design. Uh, they can be used to compare and optimize treatment options. You can do that and provide an effective, uh, the effect of individual parameters. So in a clinical trial, you have two entirely different patients. They're never identical. Whereas in a computation, you, you can figure out, look, I'm just going to change one single parameter and see how that makes a difference. So it's actually quite useful to be doing no models. Why is the principle of parsimony important? Uh, many clinical questions can be answered with few parameters. You can answer a lot of them with very few parameters. You don't need a very sophist. For example, if you wanted to ask me what is the reaction of the floor when I'm standing here, all you need is a weighing machine, right? You don't need anything more complex than that. Uh, and of course, if you have simpler parameters or fewer parameters, then uh, you, it, that permits you to conduct sanity checks. You know, basic, look here, does that make sense? Now, in, now I might be a little controversial here. Uh, there are a few distracting buzzwords going around. One is what's called the patient-specific models. Now, in healthcare, you can't really keep creating models which are patient-specific all the time. Yeah. Uh, you can have models which include patient-specific parameters, but not totally patient-specific models. And you cannot derive general answers from patient-specific models, because patient-specific models are only involved with that particular specific patient. The other buzzword is digital, digital twins in healthcare. Replicating humans, really? Can you actually replicate someone? I mean, to replicate me, you need infinite parameters. That's, that's true. I mean, if you want to replicate every single hair on my head, uh, there aren't many, but if, if you did, then that would Really, it is, it is a tricky business. So people say, look here, you can have a digital twin with, F, uh, with n parameters, one, two, three, four. No, not n, it's infinite. You can, rep, you can have a digital twin for a specific question. You can answer, look here, what's this chap's heart condition? How it's going to deteriorate or improve or what? So you can have a very specific digital twin with a few parameters, but you can't, replicate humans, and that's the way it's being understood at the moment. The third thing, which at times bothers me, and I think this is the most controversial, is model validation. Uh, now, I did, as mentioned, design nuclear power plants, and nobody said, asked me whether I had validated my nuclear power plant model. Yeah. Uh, now, in, in healthcare, the expectation is that everything needs to be, well, now that's fair, but most of the validation then happens, you conduct an experiment in the lab, you take a piece of bone, do a, go and compress it in the lab, and then you have a model of that lab experiment and say, oh, I'm replicating it. You are replicating what's happening in the lab, 
you're not replicating what's happening in the human being, right? So, so that's a, so again, I think what's really important is a sanity check. Okay, now in this talk, I'm going to talk about primarily about aging bone and bone implant systems. Uh, so there will be really no civil engineering, uh, students work involved, so it's all bio stuff, limited. So bones mechanical behaviors, bone quality, that's one, bones mechanical behavior, it's stiffness and strength. Uh, then joint replacement, and at the moment there are something like 100,000 knee replacements which happen in the UK every year, 130,000 hip replacements happening in the UK. And in fact, the, and then fractures, fractures is a big thing, uh, particularly with aging population. Uh, and I think UK spends, I've got a number here, NHS spends five billion on hip fractures and one year mortality of hip for hip fractures is larger than breast cancer. So, so that's, a, that's a number to think of. So these are th three items that I'll talk about. So first is bone microarchitecture and its mechanical properties. So what, what's bone all about? So bone is a living organ. I think it's important to recognize it adapts to the loads under which it's placed. And this is something which came from Dr. Julius Wolf uh, way back in 1836. Uh, I mean, he was born in 1836, so late, late 1800s. Uh, and it keeps changing. So that's why astronauts who uh, don't experience load will lose bone mass. If you sleep all day, you lose bone mass. Okay? And of course, uh, the women are particularly prone to losing bone mass after menopause. So that's a known thing. So uh, by the age of 71 in two women are known to ha will have a fracture which is osteoporotic. So that's the, that's the data from Osteoporosis Society. So uh, this is what Julius Wolf said, bone adapts to the loads under which it's placed. And this is a famous sort of a picture for the, of the human femur which shows that the trabeculae, this is the, the bone has a microarchitecture inside, are aligned for, uh, uh, to take care of the load in a kind of a very perfect or most optimum manner. And these are very similar to what's called the Kullman's crane. So if you apply a load from the top, then these are the stress trajectories and these trabecular human trabeculae follow similar lines. Now, largely that is true. Wolf, Wolf's statement, which is more of a philosophical statement rather than a strict mathematical law, uh, it's, been, it's been quoted as a strict mathematical law. I have some differences with it. I think people like uh, Kullman, they did much more interesting stuff than, than Wolf. But Wolf is a, um, a well-known entity, um, and I don't want to be debating whether it was his, 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 I think he made a lot of, lot of data saying that the trabeculae are aligned orthogonal to each other, uh, tension and compression, which wasn't entirely true. Uh, so inside, trabecular bone, inside the bone, it has a certain kind of architecture, and the architecture can really be defined in a number of ways. There are several parameters, but let me just sh uh, show a couple of these. So things like, what is the density? I mean, how much bone is this in, in this little cube? You know, is there a lot of, is it very porous, or is it very full? So that's bone volume to total volume, or BV by TV or canal volume to total volume, how much, how much porous, how porous it is. Trabecular thickness, how thick are each of these strands. And anisotropy, anisotropy is, is it, it, does it have the same properties in every direction, right? So obviously, it might have different properties. If you stand on, on the leg, it might have a different properties in this direction, 
to that direction or the third direction, right? So it might, will have different properties. So that's, these are the kind of uh, micro-architectural properties. And of course, there are, there are lots of others. But So the, I'll, I'll talk about three kinds of properties. The first one will be the elastic properties, then inelastic properties, and then time-dependent properties. I'll try and go through these a bit, bit quickly. So, uh, so these are three properties, elastic uh, properties. So elastic, as I said, the, you can have in an isotropy. Uh, you can see, a very easy to see is you have things like timber, for example. Uh, so along the grain and across the grain, you have different stiffnesses and different properties, right? So they don't have the same properties in every direction. So if you, for example, have a little you have a little specimen like that, you pull it, then initially it, it elongates, then it can go into a nonlinear regime, and if you unload, then the deformation, some deformation is permanent. Okay, so that's plasticity. And the third thing um, is what I'll talk about is time-dependent behavior or viscoplasticity. So I'll just do these sort of quickly hopefully. Uh, so the first bit, uh, it's done a few years ago, is we had scans, micro CT scans. Uh, so one thing I think I probably missed and maybe I should just point out. So you, we have two kinds of bone here. One is what's called the trabecular bone, which is the spongy bone inside here. And the outer shell is what's called the cortical bone or the compact bone, right? So the first bit of a set of experiments that I'm going to show you relate to the compact or cortical bone. So we obtained very high level micro CT scans of uh, cortical bone from 27 female uh, samples. These are cadaveric samples uh, from the mid part of the femur. So these are all from the femur, the middle part of the femur. And the cortical bone is about three or four millimeters, five millimeters thick at, in this region. Uh, it varies with age and we basically uh, essentially took from the interior or the front part of the bone, this is the front part, we took six samples each. So each of these little squares is about one millimeter. And micro CT, you know about CT scans, this micro CT is very high resolution scan. So this we are scanning at a resolution of something like six or seven micrometers. Now, this, all this bone was from the Melbourne femur collection, so it's Australian bone. It was scanned by Cooper in Canada, and then we did the numerical bits in Edinburgh. So it was a three-continent work. Uh, and for each of these, we took actually took six samples. So the outer part is called the periosteum. So I'm pressing the wrong button. So that's the periosteum, the out, outer side. The inner part of the tube of cortical bone is endosteum. And this is a typical kind of a analysis we did. So this is what the cortical bone looks like. The right-hand side, this is the model, the finite element model that you create. And what you get is pictures which look something like this. And you can see that a young person has pretty solid bone and an aged person has fairly lot of, lot of pores or canals in there. And uh, you have more pores at the, in the, at the endosteum or inside than on the outside. Now, to find elastic properties, all you need to do is apply six load cases computationally. So you, you take this one millimeter cube, not in the lab, on the computer, you compress it 
in one direction, second, third, shear, shear, and shear, right? So six load cases, and you try and figure out the elastic. You just need six cases uh, for elastic properties and try and figure out what, how the system is behaving. And what we got some, was something very interesting. So you can see that on the, on the x-axis, we have canal volume to total volume increasing, or the bone is becoming more porous along the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we have Young's modulus, or which indicates how stiff the bone is. And what you will see here is that essentially, you, in all cases with canal volume, as the bone becomes more porous, uh, you have a lower stiffness, which is what some, something you would expect. But what is interesting here with this data is that basically in the longitudinal direction, while you have a deterioration or reduction in stiffness, there is a greater or a larger reduction in other directions. So they, they kind of diverge. So if you, if, you, if you look, the longitudinal direction is a vertical one. Uh, the other directions are, could be radial and circumferential. So basically, as we grow old, uh, all our, the stiff bone stiffness will decrease, but it will decrease more in certain directions. And therefore, if we have some kind of a crazy accident, we are very likely to have a fracture. Okay, so this work, uh, and then also, it showed that obviously this kind of a reduction happens from the endosteum or from inside rather than from the outside. So from outside you have a lower reduction, uh, a slower reduction, inside you have a bigger reduction. And this work was done by uh, Finn Donaldson who won the Robertson Medal from the Carnegie Trust. Uh, Finn went on now is a regulator for the FDA in the US. Uh, so rather than do research, he tells others whether their research is okay or not, right? So, so that's a, a job, job he does. So uh, some more on elastic properties. So that was cortical bone. We also did the similar work with the trabecular bone. So this is going through the femoral head, the head of the femur, which is inside uh, at the acetabulum, if you go through, this is what, what it looks like. Uh, so this work was again very similar work to cortical bone done inside the femoral head. Uh, again, six load cases to determine elastic properties. Uh, again, with uh, a number of uh, femoral heads. This is what the trabecular bone looks like. Hundred, lot of lot of scans here similar results uh, and we found that basically again that uh, the stiffness decreases as porosity increases which is expected and osteo we had osteoarthritic and osteoporotic bone that osteoarthritic bone is much stiffer than osteoporotic bone uh, which is which is kind of expected and a lot of times people think that trabecular bone is orthotropic, that it has three principal directions of stiffness. We found that for trabecular bone in the femoral head, that's not entirely true. Okay, this is a kind of a, a sort of a random slide. Uh, so while, while we were doing this work, there's a group in, in India who looked at the avalanches in, uh, in the Himalayas. And they said, look here, this, this microarchitecture work that you're doing, we can actually do micro CT of snow and figure out, uh, you know, apparently you can then figure out whether an avalanche is likely or not. So they came and they compared snow and bone, of course. I mean, bone is much stiffer and much stronger than snow, uh, but absolutely similar techniques and they plotted what is called uh, a normalized eigenvalues. This is a mean intercept length tensor 
versus Young's model I, they normalized it. And it's, it's interesting to see snow and bone being plotted on the same graph. Uh, OK, so we move on to the plastic side of things. So plasticity is when you load something which leads to a permanent deformation. OK, when does plasticity initiate? Uh, now, again, we looked at trabecular bone. We had some very high, um, uh, high quality scans. And these scans, ultimately, when we created the mesh, they turned out to be something like, you know, up to 50 million degrees of freedom. So that means you have to solve 50 million equations in 50 million unknowns. And because it's nonlinear, you got to do it hundreds of times till it converges. And obviously, you can't do it on your PC. So we, we actually got time on our uh, supercomputer, the Edinburgh Parallel Computing System. And we did this with 20 samples. But the interesting thing is that essentially, if you do elasticity, as I said, you just need six load cases. But if you want to find out the plastic properties, you need infinite load cases. And of course, you can't do infinite even on a simple computer. right? So that's not. So we did 144 load cases. So that's the 144 cases. Uh, and we ran, we created an in-house nonlinear parallel FE code, used the supercomputing service, and we employed up to 2,000 plus uh, cores. So that is 2,000 plus uh, processors to actually solve these, these problems. So lots of runs, lot of, lot of computing power, and that gave us something very interesting. And that is the following. So this is where the parsimony bit comes in. Do complex stuff, but come up with simple answers. Okay. So if you look at these graphs, what you find, so this is essentially, I'll, let me just go through one of these. Uh, and I'll go through this one because this looks the nicest, actually. Uh, what you will find, so this is the, on the x-axis, is the strain at which the sample starts failing or yielding. And on the y-axis is also the strain on which the sample starts yielding and failing. In, so 1-1 one, one is in one direction, and 2-2 two, two is in the other direction. And if you say 1-1 one, one and 2-2 two, two both, then you are actually applying both the load cases. right? And now we had something like 20 samples with varying uh, porosities, which clearly will have very different strengths, which clearly have very different stiffnesses. But when you look at them in terms of strain, then you find that all these points are actually fairly close. Now, most of the finite element codes, most of the yield in engineering is based on stress. Stress is like pressure. How much load can a system take? And not on strain. And whereas in this case, you find if you start using stress, then for every sample, it will be different. In every direction, it will be different because it is system is anisotropic. But if you start using strain, you're not only isotropic. It's the same in every direction. And it doesn't matter which sample you, you're picking up which is just absolutely so and it's very easy then to incorporate in the models so so that was now we found that worked for tension it worked for compression there was a slight variation for shear and this is so you can see that in in, in the tension regime the difference is actually pretty pretty small compression slightly larger in shear it's a bit more more bit bit larger, so it's it's actually shows that strain and this stuff has actually also been shown through experiments done elsewhere, and some of this nonlinear stuff 
we are amongst the three leading groups uh, in the world who do this kind of nonlinear work. So the other two, uh, one of them is Byrne, the other is Berkeley. So bone yield is an isotropic in stress space, but isotropic strain space. And stress-based criteria, which is common, uh, which are com they require too many parameters, and experiments can uh, confirm that yielding is based on strain. And they're easy to incorporate in models. And that's what we've done. So this was the work done by Francesc, and this won the Best Doctoral Thesis Award from Virtual Physiological Human Institute, which is based in Belgium. The other thing, which Francesc obviously created a parallel code for nonlinear modeling. And for nonlinear modeling of this kind, you can never say that if you increase the number of processors, the uh, processing time increases proportionally. So here he could see that if you use 270 million degrees of freedom, then uh, eight times the processors lead to a time reduction of four and a half times. Okay, So it's not totally linear, but you actually have a great improvement. Okay, material properties, time dependent. Uh, so trabecular bone exhibits time dependent properties. Uh, and why are they important? Because you can see if you put a nail in the wall and start shaking it, then you start getting greater loosening, right? You can't just pull it off as it is. Uh, and it can explain the response to traumatic events and you can explain non-traumatic fractures. Uh, I'll try and jump through this a bit quickly. Uh, so we wanted to quantify time dependent behavior through experiments. So, and then develop models which we could put on the computer. And we did some very simple experiments. Uh, take a bone sample, uh, load it, oops, load it, and you hold it for 200 seconds, let it deform. So what is time dependent behavior? Essentially, if you take something like a, let's say, spongy stuff with water and you compress it uh, or put a load on it, then you'll see that it keeps deforming with time. You know, it's, the deformation is not instantaneous. So that was the idea. You hold this for a while, unload, then remove the load, and then of course it again keeps stretching for a while, and then you apply at the next stress level. So this is what the graph looks like. So this is first bit, load the thing, let it stretch, unload, let it recover, higher load, let it, let it further load, and so on. So that's what we did. And ultimately, we managed to create a model which turned out to be fairly complex, but which could replicate the experiment. So it was actually the best model was nonlinear viscoelastic viscoplastic. So viscoelasticity was nonlinear, and it also had viscoplasticity, which was a bit, so the, these are lines which show that it actually work, worked. And the model was developed by this chap Krishna Manda. Krishna is now a lecturer at Queen's University in Belfast. Uh, so time dependent response varies non-linearly with stress levels and non-linear viscoelastic viscoplastic model predicts the best behavior. Now this might sound a bit crazy, so let me show you a very simple example here. So this is a piece of bone, and in this piece of bone, you put in a screw. Uh, so that's the black thing is a screw. Yeah, so that's a screw. You apply a cyclic load, which goes up and um, load, remove, load, remove. So this is what the loading looks like. And this is the kind of screw in the bone which surgeons put all the time, right? So uh, what happens if you keep applying cyclic load, does that loosen the screw? And once it starts losing, then it causes infection, right? Uh, so now the results, which I'll show, one will be when you, it's at the peak load and one when it's unloaded. So this is what you get the strain patterns. So the two or three things is you get larger displacements, 
with lower bone volume. So if it's the bone is more porous, then you'll have large displacements. You'll have small increase with cycle numbers. Uh, and this is at the loaded portion. So you have small increase with cycle numbers. Now, when you remove the load, what happens? Now, ideally, in an elastic situation, if you remove the load, there's no more deformation, but not if it is plastic. So you have larger displacements, uh, obviously, with lower bone density, big increase with cycle numbers, and you get residual strains even after recovery. So you can see that as the number of cycles you are applying, you have larger strains. Okay? So, so that's, that's what we, 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 we're talking about. Now, this is the summary of what I've talked about so far. Okay, so this is uh, a talk I did at UCL about this, and they had an artist who was doing, trying to summarize what I was doing, and I think he's got the picture pretty good, except I think he's got me a bit broader than I am. Uh, okay. Uh, so, next bit, optimizing joint replacement. So, you, we have what's called the primary hip replacement, and this is what, uh, so this is a Gorius Gareth, so, uh, uh, so nothing, nothing serious here. Uh, so, this is what, what happens in the, um, in, uh, you have the acetabulum, this is a natural joint, that's the thigh bone, and this is the kind of uh, kit that surgeons use for replacing the hip. Uh, so you have an, a cup, an acetabular cup. Basically, this is a ball and socket joint. So that's the, there's an acetabular cup goes in, and that's the little thing which goes into the hip bone. So that's the primary hip replacement. Now, over time, there is a possibility, although hip replacements are very successful, that, that you might have a big hole, right? So you have a big defect and there needs to be surgery. And that's a bit we did first. Now, one of the ways to revise it, because you have a big hole, is to put in, use impaction grafting. And impaction grafting is you have crushed bone and you, you pack it up, right? In, inside, inside the hip. So it uses what's called morcellized corticocancellous bone to fill defects. And if you ensure that the short-term stability, when we use stability, that means there isn't too much motion. If you can satisfy that, then that crushed bone becomes solid bone with time. Okay, so that's the basic idea. And I've got colleagues who are surgeons here will tell you that it works. Uh, now, this is the kind of failure which actually happens. So you can see that the originally, this is what the cup was. Uh, this is a, this, sorry, this is after the failed primary. So you do revision, but after revision, because the graft didn't work, you have cup which has rotated and it's not, not really working very well. So we were actually looking at revi revision surgery. And in revision surgery, you have obviously have a number of parts, so that's the femoral head. In going into uh, the pelvis, uh, then there is an acetabular cup around it. Uh, then there is a bit of bone cement. And this is where the bit of morcellized or crushed bone goes in. Uh, then there is trabec cancellous bone and trabecular bone. Okay, so that's what the whole system is made of. And we created these mechanical models of what bone graft would behave like, and we could predict that this was the original position, and we could actually predict that it does get migrated if it's uh, not impacted or grafted properly. And one of the questions we immediately got asked was, how many blows do we need to put in to impact it properly? 
And my immediate, obviously, response was 42 is the answer for everything, isn't it? Yeah. So um, what's it called for answer to life, universe, and everything? So, but of course, we did try and work that out. It depends on how hard you hit, and 10 to 15 blows apparently works well. And this was the work done by Andrew Phillips, who got the best medical engineering PhD award uh, uh, from IMACE and Orthopedic Research UK. Andrew is a reader at Imperial now, uh, and I think he might be joining online. The other thing which Andrew did was normally how is the pelvis supported? Uh, people put in some fictitious supports. He actually put in all the muscles and ligaments and created a fairly complex model. And this uh, model showed that the stresses in the pelvis are far more uniformly distributed than previously thought. So basically, our, structure, our, our musculoskeletal system is fairly optimized. Uh, knee implants. Again, I can work done by Noel, and you can see Noel published a lot. It's been was very productive, but I'll just show two slides from Noel. Uh, and this is trying to compare what is called the CR or cruciate retaining and posterior stabilizing implants. So. Now, one of, one of the things which surgeons very commonly use, a term which surgeons use, is what's called stress shielding. Now, stress shielding is because you put in an implant, the implant start ta starts taking most of the load, and the bone doesn't. So if the implant is taking the load, the bone is not experiencing stress, then bone thinks it's not required anymore, and therefore you have bone resorption. So you start losing bone. Now, in both these, the, the idea was which is better. And one of the things which Noel did was he, he worked these out and he found that both of them actually lead to stress shielding and there's, no, there's not a very specific difference between the two. So sometimes you can clearly point out the differences, but in this case, you can see that this is the stress pattern for an intact knee, and these two, they look pretty much similar. So the two implants both are just as good or just as bad. But I mean, we know that knee and hip implants now work well for 15 to 20 years, right? The, and the age is actually increasing. Uh, comparison again, where things don't work so well, or one which is better, the other. So there's a critique. OK, so uh, things don't work very well. So this is the picture on the left. That's a full knee. This is a partial knee implant, so uni unilateral knee replacements. So two of the implants that we were looking at is what's called the all polythene implant and the metal backed implant. And this was done by Chloe. And Chloe is a surgeon, actually, and she worked on the MD in engineering with modeling. Chloe is here in the audience. Uh, and she won an IMACI award for this. And we were wondering if clinicians start winning in engineering awards, then what happens to the engineers? Right? So, uh, so this is the simulation. And it basically showed that you get large strains in cancellous bone with all polythene implants. So they, were, they turned out to be worse. And then, then did something really smart here. We put some kind of acoustic tensor, uh, acoust, acoustic sensors. And with acoustic sensors, when you loaded them, uh, loaded the uh, the more, uh, this was an actual physical experiment. Then you could actually hear sounds within all polythene implants. So these black dots are basically, uh, what do we call them? 
the banks or something which, which comes every time there is a little fracture. And you see that this, is hap this happens much more with all polythene implants rather than with the metal backed implant. So this was in a way a validation of the fact that all polythene implants are actually worse than metal backed implants. So last bit, let me talk about optimizing fracture fixation. So there's a lot of fracture fixation devices uh, we worked on, but I'll just talk about two. One which is called the Elezero fixator. Uh, so this is like, these are the rings here, rings and they are wires which go through. So there will be rings on either side of the fracture and uh, with time the thing actually heals. So I think it's also used if the, if you, if you can actually, if you actually chop off the bone, create a bit of a space put the Lazaro fixator, then that space gets filled up. So you can actually increase height. That's how I became so tall. Uh, so I think that's, that's the way this, uh, this stuff actually works. So uh, if there is a problem of unequal limbs, then this, this is a technique which can be used. The second one which I'm going to talk about is what's called locking plates. And this is like the Meccano set which we used to have as kids. So that's what surgeons really, really use. So what are the key expectations from a fracture fixation device? Three, firstly, it should promote healing. Second, it should be able to sustain loads. So obviously, it shouldn't fail on under loads. And it should not loosen at the, you know, there are pins and wires going through the bone, it should not loosen at that interface. So that's, these are the three key clinical expectations. Now, for promoting healing, you need what's called uh, the right interfragmentary motion. So a lot of times people would think that if there is a little fracture gap, you want it to be really tight, but actually you need some movement. And that motion in between the fracture, it creates callus and it helps in bone, bone healing. And it's, that's the right way. It's, it's called the secondary way of healing, but it actually is, is, is a way that bone heals better. Uh, the device should be able to sustain loads and that's stress and fatigue. It should not loosen at, at the interface. That means the strains at the interface we've already seen should not uh, be large uh, or they can cause patient discomfort or infection. Again, back to the system of parsimony, we found that these first two requirements could be solved with very, very simple models. The last one, uh, requires a bit more modeling. But a lot of times, it's the first two which are key. You don't want, uh, uh, you want the bone to heal quickly. If it heals quickly, then it's unlikely that there will be loosening. Uh, and you don't want the device to fail. And you can do this with very simple models. So let's look at the Elizero fixation bit first. And we used an extremely complicated model. Uh, Elastic properties, orthotropic, vary with age, variation with inside and outside, bone nonlinear, all kinds of complexities. So this is what the shape looked like. We created different material properties for young, old, and uh, uh, young, old, and middle-aged. Uh, we created directions. We put in Elizero fixators, and you can see that uh, the bone is not central to the ring. Uh, it's actually quite eccentric. And this is the kind of picture we get of bone yielding. And this is something which I think uh, clinicians understand quite, quite easily. So the red bits are the bits where the bone goes sort of beyond its yield levels. So that's the black thing is a wire. It's a thick wire going through the bone. This red bit is where yielding is happening. And you can see that as you grow older, you have bone, more bone yielding. Now, 
obvious thing, the amount of yielded bone, it increases as you age. If you put in the same type sort of fixator, uh, just two wires, you have much larger yielding. That is what two wires, if you put four wires, you have lots of holes, but less yielding. So, so that is the way it works. This is all loosening stuff. If you increase the wire tension, then obviously you have less bone yielding or bone failure. But of course, you cannot increase the wire tension too much because otherwise uh, the wires will break, right. Uh, but the interesting bit is this. Whatever kind of uh, uh, you use young, old or middle aged properties, the interfragmentary motion which, de which decides on the healing, it does not change very much whether the person is young, middle aged or old, right. So basically, one can do a very simple model if you are just interested in the interfragmentary motion. So that is that's, that's the thing, you do not need a very serious patient specific model. Uh, so interfragmentary motion is independent of age. Obviously, there is increased yielding with aging and increased wire tension reduces bone yielding. So that is what was with the Elizero fixators. Locking plates, now these are known to work well with in osteoporotic bone as you age, so you have fractures, people use that. Uh, now one of the things which we found was really important, the two things very important, one is what is called the working length. So if you have, let us say if you have a fracture, that is a fracture and you put in, that is a plate and you put in screws then this distance between the nearest screws is what is called the working length. That makes a big difference what the working length is. The, in terms of modeling, the other thing is you need to have a nonlinear geometric model, otherwise you get the wrong answer. So if you have a linear model, that is the line and if you have a nonlinear model, that is the line. So that is the big thing. That is a working length and locking plate failures are also known. So, you can have non-union or delayed healing. Uh, obviously, they do, it depends a lot on the working length. Plate breakage, very common, again depends on, primarily depends on the working length. And then of course, you can have screws loosening and it is not clear whether it is working length or screw configuration. I mean screw configuration, simple, which, screw, which holes in the plate you need to fill in or bone quality. So that is not entirely clear. Now what you would be surprised by is the fact that there are actually journals and papers which have been extensively referenced which apparently say, which clearly say that if you have a larger working length, then you will have smaller stresses in the plate. So this is like saying if you have a longer span bridge, it is safer. If you have a short span bridge, it is unsafe. Now that is that's crazy and lot of surgeons actually believe that. And, and the reason is what they would do is rather than apply a load, they would bend it by the same amount. Now, if you actually twist it by the same amount, if you twist a very small thing by 20 degrees and a long thing by 20 degrees, then you will obviously in the long thing you will have lower stresses. But then these systems are not being twisted by the same amount, they are being applied the same load. So, so there is there is a bit of a Bit, bit of a misunderstanding and it, it goes on, it, it is it's perpetuated. Of course, if on application of load, the gap closes, then the stresses can be, can be smaller. So, how do you choose a screw configuration and you want to clearly have fracture, these are three quantities. So, first, Choosing a screw configuration, if you based on this, we can predict it by using relatively simple models. 
and it's influenced mostly by geometric parameters and what kind of plate material you're using. And this is what uh, we found that if you have uh, if you have this sort of system, so you have these configurations, see that's smaller working length, larger working length, you have this, these are the screws which have been filled up, these are screws filled up, and you'll see that obviously with increasing working length, you get larger interfragmentary motions, but when you start looking at the difference between two cases, where in one case the bone is osteoporotic, and in other case it's not, there's only a very tiny difference. Okay, so there isn't a big difference here. So based on this, a very simple app was kind of created. So you, it can be done on a mobile or a laptop or whatever. So, and it needs to be worked on. So if there's someone here who's willing to fund its further work on it, please, uh, please get in touch. So the idea really is, okay, the surgeon actually selects a kind of a plate, decides the plate material, puts in a, couple, a few parameters from uh, the patient. Uh, look here, what's the leg size, what's the fracture gap, you know, and so on. So some of these can be worked out from the x-rays. And then you get, you can get graphs like this. So it's not, this is not the only graph, which actually tells you what the interfragmentary motion is likely to be at with different working lengths and at different applied loads. So the, this sort of an app can not only be used for um, you know, fracture planning, but also for, for subsequent rehabilitation, you know, whether the patient needs to be supported, uh, uh, what kind of load would you advise the patient put on his limbs after uh, he's had a fracture fixation. Uh, and we compared this with a lot of in vitro tests, so actual experiments which have been conducted. And we found that it actually compares well with a whole series of tests. And these tests were conducted at different places by different people. So choosing a screw configuration, uh, if you're looking at screw loosening and strains within the bone, then it requires more complex models. But if you're just looking at interfragmentary motions and plate failure, then you don't need complex models. So this needs to be a bit more patient specific. Uh, so this is again showing that there is a difference in strains. You can see if you're using healthy bone or osteoporotic bone. And this was a work done by Alistair, Alistair McLeod. Alistair won the Bohr's Traveling Fellowship, and he is now uh, he is now one of the founders or one of the leading chief technology officers of a new plate developing company, which uh, which is undergoing clinical trials. So, entrepreneur. entrepreneur. Uh, so, this is basically. Uh, the summary that if you're looking for interfragmentary motion, then patient-specific material properties play a very small role. Implant bone interface modeling, they play a small role. Device configuration obviously plays where you put in the screws. Nonlinear geometry you need to incorporate, very easy to put in, and load conditions obviously play a role. But if you want to consider device loosening, they all play a role. Now, this is the picture I uh, from I was in the fracture fixation bit, I got invited to do a talk in India, and it was actually having done talks in West, US, Europe. Uh, this was actually quite exciting because being called home uh, to do a talk, and they do it in style. So you, they have a big billboard uh, with your with your picture on it. So this was what is called the Kiki Dolakia eponymous lecture. Uh, it's been done by quite, I think, people I regard very, very highly. But also on the same billboard was this lady. Uh, 
And I, I didn't know her from anybody, but apparently she was invited to do an inspirational talk. And she was actually thrown out of an Indian train. She lost both her legs and had spinal fractures. And then after that, she got her spinal fractures fixed with two prosthetic legs. She climbed the seven tallest peaks in the world. And that was, I mean, having a picture with her on the same board was, you know, very, you know, humbling. Right, so uh, before I get to the end, this is some of the current stuff which we are, my students are working on. Uh, so one of them is trying to see what happens with fracture as the fracture angles change. And we see that the uh, interfragmentary motions and uh, the load sharing clearly changes, which is something not normally considered by the surgeons. Then we are again creating not patient specific, but very generic models of the spine. Uh, and what we will do is just bend it in whichever shape to create a scoliotic spine to figure out what should be the best correction technique for scoliosis. Uh, another project is looking at uh, transfemoral amputees. And these people are known to lose bone mass in their amputated leg. Uh, and we think we know that what the cause is, which has not been previously discovered. So it's again what we call as disuse osteopenia, which is what's happening here. Uh, and that's the work we going, we're doing here. And Yi uh, has just started. He's working on uh, a new device, which has been used for his, uh, joint replacement. He's trying to see if it works for uh, fractures. And this is uh, Abbas, again, generic models for uh, evaluating fracture risk when you, when you have lesions in the bone due to cancer. Uh, and again, we're seeing what happens if you change the location and size of the, of the lesion. So this is, again, a generic model. We're not picking up a specific patient and trying to look at it. OK, so uh, this is uh, a congress which is actually happening in Edinburgh. I'm delighted to be asked to actually chair this. And I've got my co-chair, Chloe, who's a clinician uh, here. And it will bring something like 1,000 people to Edinburgh. It's a fairly big, big congress. So this is an advertisement here, actually, for anyone who wants to actually uh, participate in there. Uh, and of course, now having been, having lived in Edinburgh for a while, having in biomechanics area, I was just counting the number of people I've written papers with uh, in biomechanics alone. And it turned out to be 82 collaborators. Right? So it's, it's a lot of people in, in the short period I've been in, in Edinburgh. So now, of course, as I said, I've been here for a while now. Uh, so I regard myself as a hyphenated identity, Scottish Indian. So I have a Scottish identity and an Indian identity. And obviously, both my identities rejoice every time India beats England in cricket. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so, uh, uh, so, so that's, that's a great bit. So thank you all very much. And uh, thanks to Ian and Gareth for the introductions today. And really big thank you to Chris, who organized this IT. And a very, very big thank you to Louise, actually, who's actually organized the whole thing related to this lecture. Thank you very much.
happy to take questions. So thank, so thank you very much, Pankaj. That was a, a superb lecture where I not only got a, a, a really good impression for the modeling, the computation, the engineering, the, the, the medical part to that as well, but also all the way through when you talk about your 82 collaborators, I got a really strong feeling for everybody who you have worked with and the diversity and the successes that they've had as well, some of which is out here today. You've said that you're happy to take questions. We were actually building up a tradition in the college that this is a celebration as well to do these, where we can go outside and celebrate with some wine and ask questions directly to Pankaj that way and all enjoy some more of each other's company as well. So if people are happy to do that and come and ask anything that they would like to, that would be really wonderful. Please stick around, there's lots to do, lots outside to do. Pankaj, I'm sure, will be really happy to speak to everybody. So Pankaj, once again, thank you very, very much Thanks, for this. Thank you.